All right, once again, it's good to see everybody here this morning. If you want to turn to Luke chapter 3, we're going to be picking up our study there. And last week, we were, we, uh, were concerned with the, this topic of repentance, which is really what John the Baptist's ministry was all about. And we covered in some detail uh, what true re- repentance looks like. And it's on the heels of that that we continue this morning, and we're going to be picking up in verse 15. It's still uh, talking about uh, John the Baptist's ministry. It says, Now when the people were in a state of expectation, and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was a Christ, John answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water. But one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clean, clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. So John the Baptist is having this success, successful ministry. Uh, he's gone out into the wilderness. He's baptizing people there at the Jordan. And people are just coming to him in groves uh, to repent of their sins, and to, to turn back to God. And the fact that they were all were waiting with expectation and wondering in their hearts as to whether John the Baptist was the Christ is an indicator that John the Baptist was successful in what he was doing. Because if you remember, really he was paving the way for Christ, paving the way for the Messiah who was to come and preparing people's hearts for the Messiah who was coming. And the fact that now they're all Uh, have heightened expectation, the fact that they are now looking for who it might be that is this Messiah, is showing that he's being successful. The people's hearts are prepared now, uh, to some extent, to receive uh, the Messiah and to uh, listen to what he has to say. And he says, As for me, I baptize with water, but one is coming mightier than I, and I'm not able to fit... I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John the Baptist here recognized that his ministry, although successful, and although it was accomplishing what it was purposed to do, was, in a sense, limited. In other words, there was only so much John the Baptist could do for the people. He could bring them to the water. He could baptize them in water. He could encourage them to repent. He could encourage them to bear fruits unto repentance, as we talked about last week. But there's only so much he could do. His ministry was good. It was fulfilling his purpose, but it was limited. He says, all I can do is bring you to the water. But Jesus Christ was the one who would come and actually be able to bring them to God. And it was him who would baptize them with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And he says, his winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And so, again, John the Baptist is saying, I'm not the judge. Uh, I'm not the one that is going to ultimately bring about what I've been speaking about. There's another one who is coming who is going to be the absolute judge. So, I'm limited in the sense that I can only baptize you with water and bring you to repentance to God. I'm also limited in the sense that I can't, I'm not the judge. I'm not the one who is going to be able to differentiate between those who would be the chaff which was uh, a symbol of those who would be driven away by the wind and judgment as they would, uh, that's how they separated the chaff from the wheat, right? They would uh, throw it up into the air and the chaff would be carried away, but the wheat would fall, uh, the true wheat would fall. The separation that would take place, he said, I'm not the one who's going to do that separation. There's another one coming. And so John the Baptist, again, is pointing to Christ. And it says in verse 18, So many, with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. But when Herod the Tetrarch was reprimanded by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the wicked things which Herod had done, Herod also added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. And we've talked about this story in some detail uh, as we've gone through Matthew and, and uh, Mark. But if you remember, Herod had married his brother's wife. So Herod was a tetrarch. This is Herod Antipas, right? Well, he had another brother that was living in Rome. He wasn't part of the, uh, the ones who were the sons of Herod the Great that were ruling over in uh, Palestine. 
This was another brother that was living in Rome. He hadn't really been given the title of Tetrarch or anything like that. And he had uh, this wife, uh, Herodias, who, uh, when Herod Antipas had traveled to Rome, he coerced her to leave his brother and to come with him. And so he had basically taken his brother's wife as his own wife. And that was something that was uh, definitely frowned upon, to say the least, in Jewish society. The only time you took your brother's wife was if your brother died. If your brother died then you had, and didn't have any children, then you had the obligation to uh, take your brother's wife and bear children for your brother, but not while your brother's still living. And that's what Herod Antipas had done. And John the Baptist had told him that that was not right. That was something that was wrong. And because of that, he was shut up in prison. Now, as we think about this, this summary of events that took place, you know, uh, during the baptism, but or during his ministry and in connection to his ministry, we can learn some lessons from these verses. Because what John the Baptist gives for us in this rendition of what happened by Luke is he gives us what it really means and how you can tell if a person is really speaking for God. If you remember in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus had said that false prophets would come, but he said that you would know them by their fruits. John the Baptist had the right fruits to show that he truly was a prophet of God. He was a man that was speaking for God. And there's some indicators about his ministry that kind of point to that, that the people could see and say, yeah, this is a legitimate man speaking for God. And these are the same things that we can look at as we listen to people speak about the Bible or speak about life in general. Uh, we can use these same things as kind of a, a litmus test, whether someone is really genuine and sincere or if they're really just uh, giving us false information for their own benefit. Notice what he did, going back to verse 15. He didn't seek his own glory. It says, the people, of course, were waiting in a state of expectation, wondering in their hearts about John whether he was the Christ. And, and he basically tells them, no, I'm not the Christ. John the Baptist was not speaking what he was speaking. He was not doing what he was doing for his own sake. And that's evident in the fact that in the time when he could have assumed the role of Messiah, had everyone anoint him as king, because they were all looking for a, a physical king who would uh, lead Israel uh, in a campaign against Rome and make them an independent nation again, uh, he could have set himself up as king. He could have really elevated himself and really promoted himself. He had a, this was a, a fork in the road for John the Baptist. This was a moment of decision that he had when he could have gone the route of fame and glory or of humility. And he chose the pathway of humility. And that is a good indicator as to whether someone is really genuinely telling us the truth about God or not. If they are seeking their own glory, if they're just speaking words to become famous or powerful or to move up the corporate ladder, uh, if, it's, if the message is really all about them and really ends with them, it's a good chance that they're not really sincere in what they're saying. And it, it, there's a good chance that they're just really promoting themselves. And whenever a person, especially when you're talking in the context of uh, a preacher or a teacher, if they're all about promoting themselves, guess what typically happens to the message? It gets tainted, right? I'm going to speak what the people want to hear. I'm going to turn it in, a, in such a way that um, it'll increase my popularity. And it may not even be necessarily pleasant things. It may say shocking things just to get their name out there, especially this day and age. The more shocking you are, the more popularity you get, the more views you get, all that type of thing. Um, but is a person's ministry, is a person's service for the Lord really about themselves or are they for the Lord? And I guess while we're talking about it, each of us could ask ourselves that question. It doesn't necessarily have to be projected onto somebody else that we're trying to consider whether they are legitimate or not. We can look at ourselves. Why are we serving the Lord? Why do we do the things that we do for the Lord? 
Is it so that people will look at us and say, oh, they're such a spiritual person. Look how hard they're working for the Lord. Are we building a name for ourselves? Or are we pointing people to Christ? Remember, we should do all things for the glory of God. We have been bought with a price. Remember that last verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We've been purchased. We've been purchased by God to be used as instruments for God, for His glory, not for our glory. And that's something that we have to remember. So, as a matter of fact, there's a, there's a verse for that <laughs> in 1 Peter. In 1 Peter, uh, Peter talks about that as well. When he talks about, in verse uh, chapter 4, this is 1 Peter chapter 4, in verse uh, 10, he says, As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. In other words, if you have a gift, you have an ability, you have something to offer the church, you use it just as a steward of the, of the manifold, the many uh, facets of the grace of God. I just have a little facet of, of God's grace, you could say. And I'm just being a good steward over that. That's, that's really all you're doing when you're serving God and serving people. And he says in verse 11, Whoever speaks is to do it as one who is speaking the utterances of God. In other words, I'm only, I, I come to the Lord with a humble attitude, seeking the desire that He would give me the words to speak, that He would open up His word, that I might understand it, that I may speak in accordance to truth. Uh, again, it's all about pointing to him. It's not that, oh, I'm this great orator, uh, orator or I'm able to speak in this elegant way, but rather, let me speak what the Lord wants me to speak. And whoever is, is to serve is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. You know, if I'm serving people, if I'm doing good for the church, it's not that, oh, look what a wonderful person I am, and I'm, I'm speaking for all of us here. I'm not a, this strong person, but I get strength from the Lord, and that's how I'm able to serve. If, if ever there was a time when we realized just how vulnerable we are, it's, it's in these days, right? If we are able to serve, if we are able to help other people, it's purely because God is helping us, and He's given us the strength to do that. And he says, so in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory, the dominion, forever and ever. Amen. So we have this attitude so that God receives the glory. If you find someone who's really doing things just for their own glory, and to promote their own self, that's an indicator that they may not be genuine and sincere. Now there's different, there's different levels of that, and sometimes it can be murky and difficult to differentiate uh, there's the obvious person who's just over the top just promoting themselves and then there's others who might even be pretending to be humble pretending to live a certain way but all the while trying to receive glory so there's different places within that spectrum that we're looking at and it can be difficult to tell but that could be one indicator that you could use to determine whether someone truly is a man or a woman of god working for the glory of god and then uh, also, one who is speaking for God and speaking the truth typically is going to have a balanced message. That's very important. As John was talking about Jesus Christ, he says, He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The Holy Spirit would come as a blessing, right? Uh, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's giving as a blessing to people. To believers. Ephesians chapter 1 talks about the fact that the Holy Spirit is given to us as we come to believe in Christ. It says that He's given as a guarantee of our inheritance. It's a wonderful thing to receive the Holy Spirit. But fire is usually an indicator of judgment. So in other words, this Messiah that was coming was either going to baptize Him in the blessing of the Holy Spirit or <coughs> in the judgment of fire. See how balanced His message is? Matter of fact, if you continue to read in verse 17, his winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor. Um, and he together his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Again, a, a message of blessing, judgment. The wheat would be gathered into the barn where there's protection, where there's oversight, where we can live in the presence of God forever. But the chaff was going to be burned up in judgment. One of the, the 
the difficult things, being a teacher or, or being a preacher, is, is walking that line, right? Because you can fall on other si- either side of it. Either you can have a, a preacher who is all about judgment and fire and, and God's vindication and, and the people are even scared to even you know, do anything because they have the wrath of God as though he's looking over their shoulder just waiting to consume them. And you can have that extreme where you, there's nothing but judgment of God and wrath of God and indignation of God being preached each and every Sunday. But you can have the other extreme as well. Well, God is just this grandfather in the sky who wants to give you candy. He wants to bless you, and, and you can never do anything wrong, and you can see where the two extremes can go. Typically, a person who is, who is really trying to accurately project God's truth is going to be somewhere there in the middle. Both being able to talk about, yes, there is judgment, there is eternal condemnation for those who reject Christ, but then at the same ta- time can talk about the love of God demonstrated through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Uh, there's there's got to be balance. And, and that's true not just in trying to uh, determine the fruits of a person who claims to be speaking for God, but it can be also true of doctrine as well. As you consider the various doctrines that uh, have been postulated over the years typically the ones that kind of get off track are the ones that are extreme I find that to be the case usually and and, and they always have verses for it uh, a person who has this extreme view usually have verses to back up what they say right um, that maybe the one of the biggest uh, ways this is expressed is between free will and the sovereignty of God. Uh, you have the Calvinist view that talks about, that mainly focuses on the sovereignty of God. Man can't do anything. Uh, we, we don't choose God. We don't do anything, but God uh, directly uh, directs every little detail of people's lives, and he picks and chooses who's going to be saved. As though there's nothing that we can do at all to either choose God or to be drawn to, or to seek after God. But on the other hand, we could also say, there's another extreme where you can say, well, we can focus so much on the free will of God that we forget that there is a sovereign God who's in control of everything. And we can have a God who is so distant and unrelatable to human circumstances that, yeah, we pray to him, but we don't really expect anything from him because we don't really think that he's involved anyways. So again, a lot of times, there's a lot of extremes between these two things, and a lot of times it's it's not, uh, you know, this or that. It could be this and that, and and we got to be very careful about that. Um, faith and works. <laughs> you post anything about faith and works on social media, and you'll it'll blow up with the comments and the arguments that get played on that. But a lot of that plays with this extreme. They're either all about faith or they're all about works. And, and there goes the, the battle. But usually God's word is balanced. And usually, yeah, maybe you can find verses that might prove your extreme view. But other people have verses that explain their other view. And it's not because there's a contradiction. It's just because the two have to be mel- melted together into one complete uh, understanding. So... Having a balanced message is a good indicator of a person who is really trying to accurately teach God's word. And then, also a person who is seeking to really be speaking for God and to be accurate with the word of God is usually a person who is going to do it even while persecuted. And we see this with John the Baptist here. John the Baptist was a person who was not afraid to be persecuted for what he said. If John the Baptist, going back to this idea of glorifying himself, but if John the Baptist was really a fake and he was just making up uh, this whole kingdom of God is coming type thing, when the religious leaders came to him, when he had the opportunity to impress them and to really work his way up the corporate ladder in religious circles, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have called them a brood of vipers. Uh, 
It's just not something you do if you're wanting to be promoted among people, as they call them a brood of vipers. But John the Baptist was willing to speak what needed to be spoken, even if it meant negative consequences. And it's true even in the situation with Herod. He told him straight up, the relationship you have with Herodias is no good. And, and, and you're wrong for that. Well, what did he do? He ended up getting thrown into prison. So John the Baptist was shown to be legitimate because he spoke what was true and right even when it meant uh, difficult times for him. When it meant that things weren't going to go well for him. Again, not really promoting himself, but really speaking because he knew that this was true. And he was willing to speak it no matter what. This can also be another indicator whether someone is really speaking the truth. Observe them, watch them, and see how they respond to hardship and difficulty. When the fire is turned up, how do they respond? Do they pack up their bags and leave? Do they, you know, do they still hold firm to what they had taught? Are they staying true to what God is saying? Or do they, again, cast it to the side and run away? Um, being able to speak even in the midst of persecution, even though it means harm for yourself, that's when you know a person is legitimate. Now the good thing about this as well is we can now go back and look at the eyewitnesses of Christ in, in the New Testament and, and give them the same litmus test and see were they legitimate speakers of God. The apostles, to be more specific. Were they doing it for their own glory? Is that why they went about talking about Jesus Christ raised from the dead? You realize all of them, tradition tells us all of them were killed, martyred for that message. The only one who wasn't is, John, is the Apostle John. And even tradition tells us that he was uh, burned with oil. And we know about his exile in Patmos as well. He was definitely persecuted. But they definitely weren't doing it for success. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, you know, we are of all men <laughs> despised. You know, we, we're the scum of the earth so that you can have life. We live out death so that you can have life. Um, it wasn't a prestigious position to be an apostle. Looking back now, everyone, of course, lifts them up, and, we, and rightfully so, for their faithfulness and the fact that they were the ones who gave us the truth that we have contained in the Word. But at the time, they were the all-scouring of the earth. And they had a, a balanced message. They would both speak, as you read the book of Acts, the message that they would give was one of judgment that's coming. There's one who's coming to judge the earth, but at the same time that there is forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, a balanced message. And then also they spoke even while persecuted, going back to what we, what we just mentioned. But... Yeah, they had a very difficult time. You go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul lists out a lot of the things that he went through. And, and despite all that, he still was speaking the same message, giving the same message. So um, we can see that even the eyewitnesses in the first century were legitimate. They, they really believed they saw the risen Christ, and rightfully so. All right, so now as we continue in the chapter, uh, we pick up in verse 21 with the baptism of Christ. It says, Now when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized, and while he was praying, heaven was open, And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came out of heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. All right, so Jesus now is going to be baptized. And, oh, and by the way, um, for those who are, who are concerned about the chronology here, uh, the, Luke does get a little bit out of chronological order here because he's talking about uh, John the Baptist already being in prison. Well, how is he in prison if he's baptizing Jesus here? Uh, also, if you're familiar with the Gospel of John, you know that, that there was a time when Jesus... Was, had his ministry at the same time John the Baptist had his ministry going. And they were both baptizing uh, at the same time. But John the Baptist's ministry was diminishing as Jesus's was increasing. Luke here is just, he's, he's drawing straight lines. He's just showing, okay, I've, I've talked about John the Baptist's ministry and completion. 
Now I'm going to move to Jesus's ministry and completion. So there's a, he's more focused on topic here than chronological order. But nonetheless, so now Jesus is about to begin his ministry. And it says, while he was praying, heaven was open. Luke talks about Jesus praying more than any other gospel writer. Luke was really big on prayer. Uh, even in the book of Acts, you have that, that prayer by the church in, in Acts chapter 4 where the, the whole room shakes. You know, they wanted more boldness to speak for the name of Christ. Uh, time and time again, Luke talks about prayer. But here we have Jesus Christ himself praying, which is an indicator that we too ought to be people of prayer. If he, wanted, if he prayed, then we should pray as well. But it says, while he was praying, the heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in a bodily form like a dove. Luke is the only gospel writer that actually says that he came in a bodily form like a dove. The other ones just say uh, he alighted upon him or descended on him like a dove, which could indicate that it could be any type of form, but it, it was just descending like a dove would descend. But this shows that, yeah, it actually came in the form of a dove, uh, visibly, and the people could see that. Which could, and, and Bible thinkers ever since probably these books are written, have tried to understand why the Holy Spirit came like a dove. What's the symbolism of that? What is it showing? Some have suggested that it's a, a symbol of the type of ministry that Jesus would have. Whenever the Holy Spirit appeared, he typically would appear in a way that represented what was going on. If you remember in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came with tongues of fire. Well, what was he going to do when he... Um, and dwelt the apostles. He was going to help them speak in tongues. And so the Holy Spirit was shown in representation of what he's about to do. And some would say that the Holy Spirit coming down on Jesus shows what his ministry was going to be about. It was going to be about innocence, uh, gentleness, and beauty, that type of thing. All, uh, all things that the dove symbolizes. We could even say that there's a tie here between Christ and Noah's Ark. I think, wow, that's off the wall. <laughs> Noah's Ark and, and Jesus being baptized. But remember what happened when the waters were starting to abate? They were starting to you know, decrease? Well, first they sent out the raven. That didn't work. The raven just went and fed on the carcasses of the dead animals, most likely. Didn't do any good, but he sent out a dove. And the dove went out and couldn't find anywhere to... To land. So he comes back to the ark and they wait seven days, send the dove out again, comes back with an olive branch in its mouth. Okay, the waters are receding more and more. Wait another seven days, send him out again, and he doesn't return. Okay, it's pretty guaranteed that the waters are gone now. We can leave the ark. But the Holy Spirit showed these different levels of, I guess we could say, salvation for Noah. Uh, the, the Noah, I'm sorry, the dove symbolized that salvation was coming, that absolute salvation. Now, they had already been saved from the flood. The flood had come, and they were in the ark, saved from the, the waters that were ravishing the earth. But they had ultimate and absolute complete salvation when the waters receded and went away, and they were able to leave the ark. That's when you can say you're completely saved. And, uh, but the dove was the means by which they knew that salvation was coming, that the ultimate salvation was coming. Now, we don't have time, and I've done this in my Tuesday night Bible study on Facebook, if you want to look that up, to go through and talk about the symbolism of the ark connected to Christ. There's almost every detail of the ark somehow points to Christ in some way. And Christ is, in a sense, our ark, right? And, uh, Galatians chapter 3 talks about we're baptized into Christ. And like a person entering into the ark, he finds salvation from judgment. That's what we have in Christ. We're protected from the judgment of the world. Uh, we're placed in Christ, as Noah and his family was, were placed in the ark. But the Holy Spirit at work was an indicator that the true salvation had come. And it might just be, there's no scripture we can point to, this is Joey speaking, but it might be that there's a tie here with the Holy Spirit coming down upon Christ as a symbol of the fact that salvation was coming. Uh, the ultimate and absolute salvation that we find, found in Jesus Christ. But as this happened, it says, You are my beloved son. This is the voice that comes out of heaven. You are my beloved son, and you 
I am well pleased. You could split these two statements up. You are my beloved son. Uh, that has, that echoes uh, Psalm 2, right? Uh, you're my son, today I have begotten you. And he talks about how uh, God's son was going to rule, uh, kiss the son, you know, that type of thing in uh, Psalm 2. But then, in you I am well pleased, kind of takes us back to Isaiah 42 in verse 1. It doesn't specifically say that, but it kind of has that same idea. My servant, in whom I have delight. And it goes on to say, and, and kind of culminates in 53 when you have the servant mentioned again, but in um, humbleness, in uh, persecution, but then also in exaltation. And so here you have the idea of kingship. Behold, you are my son today, I have begotten you. But then also you have tied in that, that yeah, there's going to be suffering involved. There's going to be a plan that's going to take place. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is symbolized by this very baptism. And so Christ is foreshadowing his own death by being baptized. And so he's showing himself as he's being immersed in water and the waters and, and being brought up, just as we do as well when we are baptized. He's pointing to his death, burial, and resurrection. And when we join in, in the baptismal waters, we join with Christ by being buried with him in baptism and being raised to walk in newness and life, Romans chapter 6. Uh, so, a lot going on here at the baptism of Christ. But the main thing here, and, and this is the, the key point that's going to kind of follow through the rest of the verses, even going into chapter 4, is that God calls him his beloved son. And that begins, kind of flips the switch on the theme for Luke as we continue on. This idea of him being the son of God, the beloved son of God, becomes uh, important here. Which brings us to the genealogy. Which is in verse 23 and continues down through verse 38. It says, when he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, the son of Matthath, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jenai, the son of Joseph, the son of Mattathias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Hesli, the son of Nagai, the son of Maath, the son of Mattathias, the son of Simeon, the son of Josek, the son of Jodah, the son of Joannan the son of Risa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adai, the son of Kosam, the son of Elmadam, the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of Eleazar, the son of Joram, the son of Mattat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Eliakim, the son of Melea, the son of Mina, the son of Mattata, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Nashon, the son of Amminadab, the son of Admin, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Sarug, the son of Reu, the son of Peleg, the son of Haber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So a lot of, a lot of uh, people had passed in this time from Adam all the way to Jesus Christ. And a long list of people here. And this is being brought about when he's 30 years of age. And some people wonder why, why was it that his ministry began when he was 30 years old? And the problem isn't that there's no answer to that. The problem is, is that there's several answers to why that might be. Uh, David became king when he was 30. So there might be a connection between him and David, uh, who became king at 30. Um, you could think of also Ezekiel, who became the prophet of God at the age of 30 who was also a priest, so you could see him maybe being connected to the, the prophets. Uh, you could also see the priests. The priests would begin their ministry at the age of 30. So you could go with prophet, priest, or king. Uh, all of that would could be tied to him starting at the age of 30. But 
Some had suggested maybe it doesn't really have anything to do with that. Maybe it's just a practical thing. Maybe Joseph, in having to take care of Mary, in all likelihood, his father Joseph had passed away at this point. And that's indicated by the fact that he's not mentioned at all in the New Testament after, uh, after the event at age 12 in the temple that we talked about. It might be that Jesus just had to take care of Mary. It wasn't until he was 30 that he could kind of hand her over to his brothers, his younger brothers, to take care of her. Or maybe he had created enough of a nest egg to take care of her, provide for her. We just don't know. But we do know that he started his ministry at the age of 30. And, uh, and Luke sees that significant enough to mention it in his uh, gospel. But then you have this uh, genealogy that's given. And if you line up Matthew and Luke, and, and this has been uh, a place of, of a battleground for centuries, the differences between the genealogy of Christ in Matthew chapter 1 and the genealogy of Christ in Luke chapter 3. If you line the two together, you can see that there are differences. Not the same people are mentioned. Um, and it starts even with the, the very direct descendants of Christ. Here it says, uh, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, the son of Matthew. Already they're, they're off. Uh, not often that they're wrong, but often that they're not uh, consistent. Or, or not, they are consistent, but not uh, saying the same thing. That doesn't necessarily mean that Luke is inaccurate, nor does it mean that Matthew is inaccurate. It just means that we don't have the explanation, specific explanation of why that is, but we can think of a host of different explanations of why that would take place. Maybe one of the most popular ones is the fact that, or the, what's postulated, is that Matthew is following the line of uh, Joseph, his father Joseph, for the purpose of showing Christ as the king. If you want to show Christ as a king, you want to go through the Father. And if you follow that line, you see that all the kings are mentioned, or most of the kings are mentioned, a lot of the kings are mentioned. And the lineage goes from Solomon to Rehoboam, and then goes down and goes through the list of kings. And so Matthew is focused on the kings before he's going through the lineage of Joseph. Whereas... Luke is going through the lineage of Mary. Not so much concerned about the kingship and all that. That's not a major theme of his. As we talked about, Luke mostly is concerned with showing Christ as the Son of Man, as a, as a human being among us. And so he's more following the line of Mary, which, when you get to Solomon, doesn't go to Rehoboam down to the kings, but goes to Nathan, and then follows a whole different line of really no kings. And so he's not really concerned about that and takes a different line. And that might be why this difference at the beginning is there. By talking about Joseph being the son of Eli, maybe talking about the fact that he was the son-in-law to Eli, and Eli was actually um, the father of Mary. But because he's given a genealogy, he wants to stay true to the following the men, as was uh, part of the tradition back then. Uh, or it could be, and this is a more complicated explanation, I almost hate to bring it for you because it is kind of complicated, but in the, in the law, a brother, so if a, if a brother died, as I mentioned before, and didn't give any offspring, his brother would come and marry his brother's wife and produce offspring for his brother. And some have said that uh, Eli and Jacob, Jacob's the one listed in Matthew chapter 1, in a sense, is the mother, in that one of them died, right? And then the other took his brother's place. So Eli might be the brother of Jacob, took the place of Jacob, and then produced Joseph and had Joseph. That's a way to get around it to where you don't say one's about Joseph and one's about Mary. Both of them can be about Joseph, but both be consistent because of this, uh, this change in fatherhood because of the death of one of the, one of the fathers. And so... Joseph would have by law been the son of Jacob, but really physically would have been the son of Eli because Eli would have taken the place of his brother to give him offspring, which would have been Joseph. Now, now that's clear, uh, but the main point is that there are explanations. It is, there's no, 
this isn't like a contradiction that you can't get around that, oh, well, we got to throw out the Bible because these are different. The genealogies are different. There's explanations and, and very feasible explanations of why they would be so different. I lean more towards, uh, I'm open to any of those uh, ideas, but looking at it from the Holy Spirit standpoint, I really think that it goes back to these themes. Matthew showing Christ as the king of the Jews. Luke here showing him the son of man. And that's indicated by the fact that Matthew only goes back to Abraham. Luke goes all the way back to Adam. Shows him as the son of God uh, of Adam. And so that's what's going on here. There's another interesting thing as well. So again, we mentioned that there's a break uh, between Matthew and Luke, not only in, at the very beginning there, but also when you get to, uh, uh, to David, okay? So in David, there's a break, as I mentioned before. And it could have to do with this uh, Jeconiah. If you remember, Jeconiah in Jeremiah chapter 22 was told that, you know, he was a wicked man, and God said, you'll never have a descendant on the throne. Well, in, in Matthew, Jeconiah is mentioned... But then he immediately goes to the virgin birth as though to show, okay, well, Jeconiah is in the lineage, but physically Jeconiah didn't have a descendant because of the virgin birth. The Holy Spirit uh, caused Mary to be conceived. So Joseph wasn't physically uh, the father of Jesus, and therefore Jeconiah didn't physically have a descendant that ruled on the throne. And, and therefore Matthew's showing how he can be king, but still a descendant of the kings, including Jeconiah, but the virgin birth uh, kind of fixes the problem. Luke's not so concerned with that, and he doesn't really even have to worry about it because he's going by a different way. So at David, he goes through Nathan, verse 31, uh, and then works his way down that way, uh, not even touching the rest of the kings. So a little bit of trivia there for you. But ultimately, this uh, genealogy of Christ shows us really a fourfold portrait of Christ. If you look at the different descendants and what you gather about Christ from them, you can see him as the son of David, which shows him as king. He's the son of Abraham, which makes him a Jew. He's the son of Adam, which makes him a man, human being. And then he's the son of God, which connects him, connects him to God in a more real way than, than Adam. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But if you tie all that together, you can see that he's a a Jewish God-man king. And that's what the genealogy shows you. He's a Jewish God-man king. And so Jesus is just fascinating. All the various aspects of who he was and the different roles that he played, it's amazing to me. But this is what we find in this genealogy. Now, I did want to take some time and talk about this Son of God. And I don't think I've adequately talked about this in previous lessons. And I've had someone ask me a question about it. So what does it mean to be the Son of God? Because here, Adam is called the Son of God. But we thought, well, isn't Jesus the Son of God? Isn't he the only Son of God? Well, context, context, context. Usually in the scriptures, Son of God means someone who, was, who directly came from God. Okay, Which would be true with Adam here. Adam is the Son of God in the sense that he came directly from God. Remember, God... Uh, brought him up from the, from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. So he was directly created by God, and therefore his lineage goes back to just one person, that is God himself, right? The angels are called the sons of God for that same reason. They were directly created by God, directly came from God, as far as we know. There was no... You know, remember Jesus said that those in the resurrection will be like the angels. They're not going to be given into marriage. There's no, uh, you know, uh, having babies or children or anything like that. You'd be like the angels. You don't need to get married. They're directly created by God. And so they're called the sons of God in scriptures. Jesus is the son of God in a very unique way, but kind of in the same way in that he was born of a virgin by the Holy Spirit. And so he wasn't created by God in the sense that he didn't exist before he was born, but God played a direct role in him being born. You don't really have him being spoken about as the Son of God in the Old Testament, 
Many people think the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, is Jesus in the Old Testament, not called the Son of God yet. He's prophesied to be in Psalm 2 that we already talked about, but that's looking ahead of what he would be. And as a matter of fact, even in that Psalm, it says, Today I have begotten you, talking about the incarnation of Christ. So through the virgin birth, he could be called the Son of God because he was directly uh, create, or made into a human being by God, by the Holy Spirit. And then we ourselves are called sons of God. A lot of people aren't comfortable hearing that, but Romans chapter 8 is very clear in saying that we are sons of God. Galatians uh, chapter 4 talks about that as well. We've received the, the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. We are sons of God in that we have been also, uh, be made, we have been made new. We have been reborn in God through Jesus Christ. In Titus chapter 3, it talks about the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. What is regeneration but rebirth? So we've been given life by God directly through faith in Jesus Christ. We're baptized into Christ uh, in that sense. And we receive life. So now we can be called sons of God because we've been made new. We've been given life directly from God. So in short, son of God are those who receive life directly from God. And that can be used in different ways, in various ways, in different contexts. But Jesus is still seen as the unique Son of God. And uh, is always held up as the elder brother, as the one with the highest position, as a, the true Son of God. So that closes chapter 3, and it also closes our study this morning. I appreciate your kind attention this morning. Um, just kind of looking back, let's, let's remember... How to tell when a person is really a true, truly speaking for God. Put them under the test. See if they fit the mold uh, that uh, John the Baptist laid down. The, the test that John the Baptist gave of a legitimate person speaking from God. Let's also remember that Jesus Christ is connected to us. He connected to us and identified with us by being baptized. As we are baptized, but he's also identified with us as the son of man. With a long line, a long history. Of, of humans that went before him that he was born from in a sense and he is connected to us in a very human way and let's always recognize him as the Jewish God man king the one who can really fulfill all of our needs because he is so multifaceted and has so many different roles and functions that he plays if there's anyone here this morning who would like to give their life to this Jesus Christ the one who can be a merciful high priest for us the book of Hebrews tells us because he suffered in every way and was tempted in every way like us, except for without sin. If you want to give your life to Christ and begin living a life devoted to him, we encourage you to do that. You come forward. If you're online, contact us in some way and we will uh, work it out where you can get baptized as well. But if you have any need, please come forward as, you, as we stand and sing the song that JT has prepared.